Hi, I'm Dr. Chol Kim. I'm a spine surgeon from San Diego, California, specializing in minimal invasive techniques. Spondylolisthesis is a condition that involves a malalignment of the vertebral body. The most common place is in the lumbar spine at either L4-5 or L5-S1. And simply stated, it's when one vertebral body moves forward on the other. And when that happens, two things occur. Number one, the disc is under a lot more shear forces and tends to degenerate. And then number two, imagine a tunnel made out of rings and one ring moves forward on the other. What's gonna to happen to the center of the tunnel? It's gonna get more narrow, that's just geometry. So when a vertebral body moves forward on another, on another vertebral body, the canal gets narrower because of this shifting of the rings. So you get back pain because the disc is under a lot of shear stress, and then you get narrowing of the spinal canal, and in effect, you basically have a tourniquet around all the nerves, and you get a condition called neurogenic claudication. And imagine the nerves are just surrounded by a bunch of ligaments, there's very little space, and as you stand and walk, your legs get heavier, weaker, achier, numb and tingly, wobblier, or some combination of one or more of those symptoms um, as you stand and walk. And then when you sit down and bend over and open up the space, loosen the tourniquet, let the blood flow back in, you can walk pretty much the same amount of distance and then you have to stop and bend over. So that, that is the classic symptoms of spondylolisthesis. And we're trying to treat back pain, leg pain, and improve function, mainly with standing and walking. The condition develops in several ways because there's several different types of spondylolisthesis. Actually, there's five different types. But the two most common types that we see in the general population are degenerative spondylolisthesis and isthmic spondylolisthesis. And they're very two very different disease entities. So degenerative spondylolisthesis usually occurs in patients that are much older, maybe in the senior population. And what occurs is that over time, the treads on your tire, the disc and the facet joint cartilage wear out. And if you're lucky, they just wear out symmetrically. But if they don't wear out symmetrically, sometimes they will start sliding forward as it starts to collapse. That's degenerative spondylolisthesis. And those patients have, are more likely to have stenosis symptoms. The other more, most common type is isthmic spondylolisthesis that usually occurs at L5-S1. And no one really knows how this occurs. It's a little mysterious, but I think the latest hypothesis is that when you're a toddler and you fall on your butt, and I fell on my butt a lot, I heard, over time you may develop a stress fracture in the little bone called the pars interreticularis, that it's the bone that basically connects S1 to L5. You develop a little stress fracture, and then if you're unlucky, that stress fracture doesn't actually heal, and it becomes a kind of a hairline fracture or a pseudarthrosis. And then over time, as you start to put wear and tear on that motion segment, it wears out, and that fracture starts to elongate and separate and slide forward. Those patients tend to have mostly back pain, and sometimes they'll have radiculopathy going down one leg, and they tend to be much younger, oftentimes in their teens, usually in their 20s and 30s, and sometimes in their 40s when they present with pain to a physician that basically starts treating them. The risks of developing spondylolisthesis are kind of in two general categories. The first is kind of genetic predisposition. That's probably a fairly significant risk factor. So if a first relative had spondylolisthesis, that doesn't mean you're gonna definitely get spondylolisthesis, but it does mean that you're more likely than not, like in Vegas, than somebody else who does not have any siblings or first degree relatives with spondylolisthesis. The other half of the kind of risk is environmental. So gymnasts and high level athletes that do a lot of really um, intense physical exertion and bending at a young age, they tend to have a higher incidence than the general population of isthmic spondylolisthesis. So um, that's probably not good to do, but no one knows for sure. And then the environmental factors for degenerative spondylolisthesis, no one really knows. Um, that's still a mystery. 
you should see a specialist like a spine surgeon um, when you have severe pain and weakness. When you have weakness, there's a clock ticking, so you should see a surgical specialist relatively early on in your treatment to make sure that it's not something that they would recommend surgery on because if the weakness lasts too long and then you do surgery, it's harder to get back the strength later on. Um, also, if you're in such severe pain that you can't barely get up out of bed or you're suffering significantly, that would be a reason because sometimes a simple surgery can lead to a very rapid reduction in pain and improvement in function, even though we're usually trying to avoid surgery. Um, if your pain's not that bad, then most people will like to start out slowly. My wife would be like that. She's scared of needles, she's scared of doctors, she's scared of surgery, um, and a lot of people are like that. You start really slow with physical therapy, and as long as you're getting better, you just continue riding that horse until it stops running. But if you either don't get better or you plateau at an unacceptable level, then seeking a specialty consult with a surgeon is worthwhile just to make sure that there's not a, a simple, uh, surgical treatment that can uh, treat the lesion. There are some um, common misconceptions, but not many because we're lucky. Spondylolisthesis is a very well studied, well understood, and we've been treating it for a long time, so we have a really good track record. But if there was one misconception is that we generally tend to lean toward fusing a spondylolisthesis because I know everyone hates fusion, the F word, but when you have instability or deformity that needs to be corrected, you have to do a fusion. So some spondylolisthesis are worse than others in terms of the degree or the amount of instability, and clearly they need to be fused, but there's a bunch of them in that gray area that are kind of unstable but not terrible that maybe we can just do a decompression without a fusion. And in that group of patients, which turns out is a big part of my practice, they want to have a very minimal invasive decompression without a fusion so that you can minimize the amount of bony resection, minimize injury to the muscle, tendon, bone complex, and in the end, minimize the collateral damage of any surgery so that you do not further destabilize the spondylolisthesis. So it's not a, it's not a big misconception, but if somebody tells you all spondies need to be fused, that's a little bit of an overreach, and most patients will want to seek the option of a non-fusion. I've noticed that. The most common question that I get asked about spondylolisthesis is, when should you have surgery? Because here's the thing, you could have a terrible looking spondylolisthesis on x-rays and MRI, but you'll barely have any symptoms, you'll be very functional, and you will never need surgery. So it's not just the imaging findings that dictate when surgery is. It also is dictated by the level of pain that you're in and how it affects your function. And that's the problem. Some people perceive pain very differently than other people, and they can't help it. That's the real perception of pain, and so, um, we tend to rely on the degree of pain because most people, um, their function is directly related to their pain. They will decrease their level of activities until the pain is tolerable. And then vice versa, they'll increase their level of activities and hence improve their level of function as their pain levels are lower so that they can reach their pain threshold. So um, we almost always treat the patient based on their history and symptomatology, then look to the imaging studies to confirm uh, where the lesion is and how the lesion would be treated. Those are like the heavy duty deep questions about spondylolisthesis and treatment. Then there's a bunch of like really simple, straightforward, common uh, questions like, um, how long is the surgery gonna take? How long am I gonna be in the hospital for? Um, do, have, do I have stitches to take out? When can I drive? When can I go back to work? When can I start sports, et cetera? Um, turns out I have a really cool video on my YouTube channel. It's 22 minutes and 54 seconds long. You should watch that and it goes through all those questions and more. And if you have insomnia and you can't get to sleep tonight, watch that video and you'll be like, <sighs> Really good.
The spine surgeon is going to want to know a few very important pieces of information. The first is they want to know how much pain you're in and even more importantly, how it affects your function and quality of life. Because if you just say, I'm in so much pain, oh, I got to go now, I have a Zumba class. I hate those Zumba classes uh, because after the Zumba class, I have to go surfing and it's really annoying and my back hurts and by the time I get home, it's very annoying. That's not clinically significant low back pain. When you have pain that says, I'm not gonna go to my Zumba class because it's too painful. I'm not gonna go surfing because it's too painful. I miss a lot of days at work because it's too painful. That is probably the most important piece of information because surgery is a big deal. And we wanna kind of ask ourselves, what would I do if this was me or my family member? And the best way to do that is to paint a picture of what your life is like and what it could be or what it was like before you started having significant symptoms. Besides that, they wanna have a pretty clear picture of what you've tried so far because almost always we try reasonable non-operative treatment. And if you come to see me, I will be very, very strict about whether or not you did a PT program that has a really big focus on exercise, not massage and deep heat and ultrasound and gentle caress with fragrances. This is like a coach helping you develop a customized long-term exercise program with the goal of, this is the important part, of improving the strength and coordination of all the muscles that surround your spine either your back or your neck, so it acts like the world's greatest back brace. So it's not just strong, but it's coordinated. It would be like hitting a golf ball really far, throwing a baseball really far. I can't think of any other examples, but you know what I'm saying. You want those muscles to basically stabilize the spine and protect the weak motion segments and redistribute the loads across the spine. If you do that, and you don't get better, you'll probably end up getting targeted injections with epidural steroids. And I recommend that you try that too before doing surgery because even though it seems like it doesn't make sense, it's surprising a significant number of patients get better just from a few injections and they never need surgery. And the risk of an injection is still way lower than the risk of surgery. And if you can avoid surgery through injections, do it. The only time you would just jump straight to surgery is because you have a significant motor weakness, like the nerves are not working and they're currently being damaged, or you're in so much pain, you're practically bed bound and you cannot pursue any of those other treatments. It's just too inhumane that I hardly ever see that. I can usually talk some sensitive people, but that's kind of what to expect. And then once you get to the part where you're going to consider surgical treatment, I would recommend that you seek at least two, pin, uh, two opinions. So your first surgeon and then a second opinion, and it would be reasonable to get a third opinion. If all three agree, you're lucky and easy peasy. Worst case scenario, all three have different um, recommendations, and now you know that there's no one clear way that's the best way to treat it. And that's when it usually gets hard. Luckily, the amount of information on the internet and the amount of support groups that are out there um, is growing. So even in those difficult situations, don't give up. Keep searching, keep asking, um, because the answer will eventually declare itself. And then do one last little trick. Go back and see each of the surgeons and look them right in the eye and ask them, what would you do if you were me in this scenario or I was your beloved family member? And don't let them look away. If they look away for a second or they hesitate, that's a problem. Go with the person that says, that's exactly what I've been thinking, this is what I would do immediately. Sort of like when I go to a restaurant and I say, should I get the filet or the New York? I can tell from the waiter before they answer what I should order, so you do the same thing. So, Keep in mind that all the things that we talked about with spondylolisthesis, these are kind of generalized concepts. It's not specific to any one patient. And if you have spondylolisthesis, um, remember your results may vary. And it's really important that you get personalized care because 
Humans are complicated and everyone's different. And that is awesome for life, but it's difficult for doctors because it's not like a car. And I'm a big believer in customizing care and every patient is unique. And that's why we go to school for 20 years because we need to cram a lot of knowledge that we use to basically sort out this information and provide the best treatment recommendation for you. So good luck.